This is the story of SciFly Airlines Flight 3275. SciFly was flying an ATR-42 between the cities of Rome, Italy and Pristina, Kosovo on the 12th of November 1999. Now, this wasn't a normal scheduled flight. This ADR-42 had been chartered by the United Nations World Food Program, and so the 21 passengers were made up of United Nations delegates. To understand the story of Flight 3275, we need to take a look back at the geopolitical landscape of Kosovo back in 1999. In 1999, NATO started to bomb the country of Yugoslavia. Now, the reasons for that can be an entire video in itself, and we're not going to get into that right now. The important thing is that the airport used to be managed by Yugoslavia, and then on the 10th of June 1999, Yugoslavia fell. After that, the airspace of Kosovo would be managed by an international coalition called K4. The Helsinki Agreement on the 18th of June 1999 passed control of Pristina Airport over to the Russians. At the same time, K4 and UNMIC the United Nations interim mission in Kosovo mandated that air traffic control at Pristina be handled by the United Kingdom. As you can see, Kosovo in 1999 was a war-torn country that was struggling to get back to some sense of normalcy after the war earlier that year. Flight 3275 took off at 8.11 a.m. and by 9.57 a.m. the plane was being handed off from Skopje control to the Pristina military controllers. Within minutes of being in contact with the military controllers, the controller gave the crew the heading that they'd need to intercept the ILS approach at Pristina. The controller then asked them to descend to 5,200 feet and then 4,800 feet as he took them lower and lower, setting them up for an approach into Pristina. The airport is near mountains and the mountains peak through the fog as Flight 3275 made its approach into Pristina. At that point, they were getting ready for the approach and the controller told them that they were five nautical miles behind another plane and that they were number two for landing. The controller asked them to turn to the left. As they did, the crew monitored their position relative to the Papa Romeo India beacon, which was near the airport. The crew radioed the controller and told them that they were 15 nautical miles from the airport. He then asked them to turn to 180 degrees, setting them up for the ILS approach onto runway 17. As they turned, a chime was heard in the cockpit, indicating that their landing gear was not extended. But that made no sense. They were just turning to line up with the runway. They did not need to extend the landing gear right now. Then the pilots noted that they were just 240 feet above the terrain but it was too late for them to react. The plane started striking trees and then hit the mountain. The wreck of Flight 3275 was found by an army helicopter 10 hours after the crash. None of the 24 people on board survived. Investigators first looked at the airport itself. Now remember, this was a war-torn country and the airport was broken. Planes filed an IFR flight plan to fly into Pristina, but in actuality, the approach that they flew was visual, as radio beacons at the airport were broken most of the time. For example, an NDB at the airport was out of commission at the time of the accident, which meant that they couldn't fly an instrument approach into Pristina. Even the ILS at Pristina wouldn't give them a glide slope. The pilots were using it for lateral positioning. French Air Force pilots who used the airport said that they just flew visual when they could because of how unreliable the airport's beacons were. Just getting near Pristina was hard work. If you were flying towards Pristina, Skopje control would vector you towards the Xaxan waypoint. Then, those controllers would call up the controllers at Pristina to let them know about the inbound traffic. The controllers at Pristina would then use radar to guide them towards the airport because, reminder, their beacons were mostly broken. And making matters worse, the radar that was at Pristina was provided by a military unit, so it left a lot to be desired for civilian airplane routing. It just wasn't up to the task. This was a system that was held together with a lot of spit and duct tape. Something was bound to go wrong, and on the 12th of November, 1999, 
it did. After that, they shifted their focus onto the pilots. The plane was piloted by two ex-Italian Air Force pilots. The captain had 29 years of experience. In fact, he was all set to retire in a couple of weeks. But unfortunately, those years of experience did not translate into safe procedures in the cockpit. When listening to the CVR, they were shocked. The first officer did not call out safe altitudes during the arrival briefing, and the captain never asked for those. In fact, they were kind of unaware of where their plane was. For example, ATC gave them clearance to descend, but ATC asked them to descend below the minimum safe altitude for the area. They had charts which would have allowed them to see that they were too low, but they never questioned this. Now, anywhere else in the world, you can trust the ATC to keep you clear of obstacles, but not here. And they were explicitly warned of that fact. Just to drive home how spotty ATC radar was, the investigators had to get data from a nearby French AWAC to get a reliable radar track for the accident plane. All of this was not helped by the attitude of the airline. When they interviewed the director of operations at Seafly, they found out that not even the director of operations knew the minimum safe altitudes for that area. I can't stress this enough. The pilots were asked to check their position and the minimum safe altitudes of the area multiple times, but yet they didn't. Why? For one, these pilots flew into Pristina a lot, and that may have given them a false sense of security. I mean, nothing went wrong then. Why would anything go wrong now? Moreover, when they studied the rest patterns of the pilot, they found that they were both really fatigued. These were difficult approaches. You're essentially flying into a war zone with barely any oversight. Doing these approaches over and over again took a toll on the crew. Another thing is that the radar vectoring that they did get probably gave them a sense of safety. They probably thought that someone was watching over them. But unfortunately for them, that guiding voice could not be trusted. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Ultimately, they descended too low because of a lack of CRM and a poor understanding of the operations manual. There were no callouts, the arrival briefing was rushed, and there was no CRM or teamwork, the exact opposite of what you needed to land at a challenging airport like Pristina. But the story of Flight 3275 is not yet done. Questions still remain. The first one being, why didn't the GPWS or the ground proximity warning system sound? The ATR hit the mountain just 50 feet from the summit. Had they had some advance warning, they would have definitely cleared the mountain. Why didn't they get any advance warning? Simulations showed that had the GPWS worked, they would have gotten about 30 seconds of advance warning, more than enough to save the plane and everyone on board. Looking back at the history of the GPWS system on this plane, it had been having issues and was replaced. The old computer kept generating warnings during landings. The investigators found a letter dated September 24th, 1999, which stated that despite the fixes, the GPWS still wasn't working as intended. Suspecting a flaw in the radio altimeter, they asked ATR for a replacement radio altimeter but that new altimeter was not installed. It was supposed to have been installed on the day of the crash. It is possible that the GPWS failed on the day of the accident, or the crew might have turned it off due to all the false alarms it generated. The airline also came under intense scrutiny. It turned out that SciFly was not fit to fly such challenging routes. They were a new company, and this was just too much for them to handle. Their operations manuals just weren't up to scratch. Quote, we see a recently created airline undergoing rapid development, thus in a financially weak position, having had no time to stabilize itself or to acquire collective experience in its structures and procedures. This context is a significant factor in understanding this accident. End quote. But we still have one final question. Why was air traffic control so bad at Pristina? As mentioned before, the RAF was providing ATC services to Pristina, but none of them really knew the area. 
The controller who was guiding Flight 3275 had five hours of training on the approach radar at Pristina. Not five weeks or five days, but five hours of training. This low level of training played a part in the crash. Traffic at Pristina was sparse most of the time. But on that day, two planes contacted him in the span of two minutes. He was unfamiliar with the area, and the first time he handled multiple planes in this environment was in the real world, not a training simulation. There was no testing done to see if the controller could handle multiple planes in an area like Pristina. On top of that, he was used to handling military planes, not civilian ones. So, on that day, he was handling two planes. Initially, Flight 3275 was number one for landing. But for some reason, he switched things up and allowed the other plane to land first. Keep in mind, at that point, he had asked Flight 3275 to descend, and they were above the minimum safe altitude but he decided to extend the track of Flight 3275 to the north just a bit so that the other plane could land first. He sent them into an area of high terrain where the minimum safe altitude rose from 4,600 feet to 7,000 feet. The area of high terrain also messed with his radar. The tall mountains meant that it was hard for the radar to lock on to the ATR. Now he vectored the ATR to the north and he focused on the other plane and forgot about Flight 3275. Then, when the crew contacted him again, he asked them to turn to 180, but he never asked them to climb. He probably assumed that they were still in visual conditions, but the disorganized crew never checked to see where the controller was sending them. It is to be noted that the RAF controller was there only to provide RIS, or radar, information service. By definition, he is not responsible for anti-collision measures. Here's a quote. Under RIS conditions, a British military controller is not directly responsible for anti-collision measures. End quote. Ultimately, this comes down to a war-torn country, a hastily set up ATC system, and pilots that were not paying attention. They should have been. They were warned multiple times that they were flying in a challenging environment, but their actions in the cockpit did not reflect that. At the same time, external factors conspired to bring this plane down. First, the war earlier that year had decimated normal procedures. Then the bare-bones ATC, who wasn't really responsible for collision avoidance, and finally, the bad radar coverage in the area. They all contributed to this crash. Who do you think is responsible for this crash? The controller, the pilots, or the airline? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you want to watch another video, please do consider watching the episode on Air India Express Flight 1344. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.